So, funktioniert das? Wunderbar. Nachdem ich hier das Mobil... Now, I've, did, I've done some rearrangement of the podium here. I uh, would like to welcome you. Those of you who were here yesterday, I welcome you for the second time. I hope that we'll have some controversial uh, uh, discussions. I had to uh, moderate them already because they started uh, heavy discussions already before we even started here. I am Petra Pinsler, and we have agreed here uh, how we proceed. We have Mr. Schuknecht, he is from the finance minister, and he's baby responsible for our so-called Africa plan, uh, which uh, one of many that have been developed uh, by Europeans for Africans. He will explain to us why this is this time completely different and why this is a good plan. And then we will have uh, David D to give an answer. So what's so great about your plan for Africa, Mr. Schuknecht? And please use a microphone, otherwise we cannot translate. And one thing I forgot to mention. He who would be uh, would have difficulties switching to English. So let's start with German, better better German. And in the debate later, we'll have then English. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, um, thank you for being invited and be able to discuss about the compact uh, for Africa. This is going to be an exciting session, I'm quite sh certain. Uh, it's about the compact with Africa, not for Africa. Um, that is a very intentional wording, uh, because it's not another uh, initiative of Europeans or, or the West for Africa. But it is about a uh, strategy that has been developed jointly in the G20 context. We have the uh, G20 presidency this year, Germany, that is. And I am the deputy here for the finance uh, segment here in that G20. And in the um, previous years, uh, uh, in uh, G20, we have been talking about the importance of private investment and, uh, and, and the precondition for um, the uh, effectiveness of investment globally and in Africa. And these uh, discussions brought about that uh, many G20 countries have adjusted their conditions for investment to do make it more attractive that private investors become active. The gentleman has unfortunately his cell phone on, so he's interfering with the transmission. Uh, and uh, we try to um, uh, make sure that these investors, even they are uh, SMEs, uh, that they are uh, uh, to invest uh, uh, locally and be successful um, promoting growth and and, and, and uh, the G20 initiative to, in the context of Africa uh, aims at improving uh, conditions in order to promote growth and uh, jobs, and it has a couple of very uh, important elements. There are African countries that uh, came here and, and, and said we would like to um, uh, join in. None of the. Um, Mr. Ndi, can you tell the gentleman next to you that he uh, moves away his cell phone so otherwise we can translate it? There has to be the, the cell phone has to be switched off. Uh, the gentleman has to say he has a switch. It has a cell phone and it interferes heavily with it. Uh, and there will be five countries, and there will be two countries more uh, 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 coming. And there will be a conference in Berlin on the subject matter. And that is the first difference. The second difference. Uh, uh, it is about a partnership uh, approach, uh, which is reflected in the compact. Uh, 
and uh, that there will be reforms um, in order to improve the conditions for investment. It is also about international organizations uh, uh, coordinate their practice with these countries. And the third group in this partnership are bilateral uh, uh, relations. So relationships of G G20 countries or non G20 countries, and now it is about. It's not about fragmentation. Uh, that has always been the problem of uh, development cooperation to come to more coordination and cooperation. And these uh, three areas, um, in which uh, this country is uh, being developed, are macroeconomic stability, then uh, business environment, uh, the environment. Uh, business environment for private investment and then the finance environment. In these areas, these countries uh, uh, decide for themselves where to become active and then get uh, the uh, international organization uh, uh, in, into bilateral partnerships in uh, in Baden-Baden. We w had the first group of countries that said, yes, we want to do this. There was Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Tunisia, Morocco, and Uganda. And now in the second group, we'll have Ghana and Ethiopia with that will join this group. And there will be another uh, 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 couple of countries that uh, have uh, voiced interests and uh, and where the negotiations are still ongoing, uh, whether this is the right thing for us. And maybe they will join later. And uh, over the last couple of months, uh, these uh, uh, countries have developed their contracts together with these international organizations and will present them in Berlin. And, uh, in Berlin, uh, it's basically a political meeting where the African uh, finance ministers and the, the development ministers uh, and the 20 ministers will uh, meet uh, with the international organizations and uh, so supporting this uh, initiative politically. And the second day, there will be a major investor roundtable and a conference with investors where the African representatives uh, uh, meet with the investors, with the bilateral partners and international uh, organization and have concrete uh, discussions and uh, canvas uh, investing in Africa. Uh, in order to put that in practice, uh, G20 has uh, suggested that the African countries with the IOs and the bilateral um, uh, organization form country uh, teams. It's never been before that the international organization with the African uh, countries and the bilateral partners who work together in one team uh, in the past, this was always fragmented, it was always between the German fi um, development ministry in Ghana, for example, which is okay, but it was all very uh, much uncoordinated, and, and the support by investors is different. When you have this holistic approach, and uh, when the G20 is behind this, and when you know that this is an opportunity where countries can uh, improve their situation uh, independently. It's different than when we talk to German investors and tell them, look, we're talking to a country, and why not join? Uh, uh, so we as G20 presidency, not giving money to bring these together, or more money or cheap money. No, it is basically about us being facilitators that we form a platform for these African countries that uh, want to uh, cooperate in this investor to get in contact with these investors in order to convince them to invest in their countries. And uh, it is not just Europeans, it's Asians, it's uh, Africa, uh, Americans, what have you. It's a very international group. And the objective is to create kind of a, like a <laughs> circus, how do you call that in Germany, to create a positive dynamism and, and um, a create a positive dynamism where then uh, uh, economic development is pushed by way of investment. And uh, as a side remark here, uh, today, in addition to uh, uh, economic condition, institutional and political conditions play a major role, and of course, then there is also pressure to make progress also in these areas. Does that microphone work? 
Uh, thank you for this introduction, and thanks for abiding by the time slot allotted to you and giving us an opportunity to discuss. But there's two concrete questions. You are a representative of the finance minister. You are also a representative of the federal government, in a way. And there's the odd other plan. Are these agreed? Uh, or is what the um, uh, economic ministry uh, or other ministries are doing because their own cup of tea and is not fitting with that? Don't be too diplomatic in your response, please. Well, the good question. My answer is as, uh, reflecting the um, problem and the solution. All ministries in the past uh, did their own stuff, so there was no meaningful coordination. Now, with this information, now we have that coordination and we are implementing it, and the Marshall Plan is in parallel. Uh, is uh, going beyond the compact initiative here and there because compact uh, with Africa is about private investment, their funding. So it is a only a segment of that uh, development cooperation. But in this uh, uh, area also, the Marshall Plan would help in order uh, to support that bilateral cooperation with these countries and the investors. Uh, less uh, diplomatically worded, I'd say the uh, Federal Ministry of the uh, Economy, they had a pro-African uh, paper where you don't find the word compact. And that was when uh, we had that old thinking. But now we're also starting to uh, the uh, Federal Ministry of uh, the uh, Economy in order to get on board. Do you have a cell phone in your pockets? Uh, there's a lot of interfere. Yes, that is it. Wonderful. No, no, he got skin. Uh, yeah, he has to switch it off. Are uh, you to uh, expect an answer, uh, a, a call by your... No, no. Nicht stumm. Nein, to silence, which to silence doesn't, doesn't, no, it Now you don't need to repeat your uh, talk, but you might want to uh, supplement it with this thing that is called Europe, and Europe is always uh, these uh, plans and the other plans and the plans that the Africans have with 2063, etc. Exactly. Now this initiative is completely in line with the uh, 2030 uh, uh, Sustainable Development and the African 2063 initiative. So uh, I, I'd say this, maybe the others will disagree, but the European uh, initiative, they uh, uh, showcased a lot of uh, money with the uh, internal SC, we call that uh, FC, uh, because it's similar to the Juncker Fund, where public money is uh, earmarked uh, in order to leverage private funding that was, of course, not agreed with this initiative. But the timing is perfect. The reason why we have started this initiative is owed to the understanding that uh, the cooperation with Africa cannot continue the way it's been done. So 50 years of little uh, successful policy, it's about time that we change that. David, I think I'm going to switch into into English so you can take the headphones off and would like you to give us your assessment of what we what we just heard. I liked your, your input when we had this short debate before this um, part of the conference when you said the question, what does Africa need, is a totally wrong question. So why is it the wrong question? What does Africa need? Maybe Africa doesn't need anything at all. Does it need these kind of plans? You have your microphone over there. <coughs> Thank you very much. I, I hope I'll be able to be brief. I hope so, too. <laughs> Us too. Uh, I think uh, I would like to start with a big, big picture. 
so that you understand where my perspective is coming from. I, I have been out of this aid international development business for maybe 15 years. Mm -hmm. So I am totally out of the loop as to what they are talking about. So when I've seen these documents, I've been very surprised. But you read them. I read them. I'm very surprised because uh, I didn't realize that this is still what was going on in this world. Um, so my perspective is sort of a very different. I'm from a political world. Uh, I'm actually in the middle of a presidential campaign for <laughs> in the Kenyan for the Kenyan opposition. So we hope to win an election and do different things. Um, but uh, let me say, I think we all know that Africa had a very turbulent 20th century. And that turbulent 20th century began right here in Berlin in 1884. So I think uh, we can be forgiven for being a bit circumspect when we see initiatives talking about doing things with, for Africa, multiplicity of initiatives coming out of Berlin. Um, if you are from outside the, 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 the aid, uh, at the development discourse, when you look at these documents, you're like, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> anybody can actually say this? Uh, that was my reaction, mm -hmm. just to give a sense of perspective of, of just how, how far apart we are uh, in terms of some Africans. You know, because when you say Africa, probably talking to African governments. Because of the language of the documents or because of the content? You content, like... language, everything. Okay. Um, just the fact that they have been written. Okay. Uh, from where I see it, the fact that they've been written actually means that we're very far apart. They are part of Africa, and people like myself, who are quite influential, uh, who are very far away from that perspective. Okay? Two, um, I also then look, look back, and we follow global affairs, and I say starting from the global financial crisis uh, through to the Greek crisis in, in Europe, Brexit, um, Trump, Malili Le Pen, Five Star Movement, all sorts of things going on in Europe and the West, crisis of an aging demography. And if you ask yourself, where do European leaders find the time? <laughs> We're going to ask we've got, him. <laughs> we've got their own, looks like they should be solving global problems or because of their importance in the global mm -hmm. level. Um, why do they find the time to say that uh, this is uh, the time for Africa? It isn't. At the global level, I think there are much more pressing problems uh, to be dealt with. And uh, by throwing a migration there doesn't make them African. <laughs> so ask yourself, what's going on? Um, and then ask yourself, what, what is all this about? And I begin to think, to looking to me, I think the, 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 the West, there's another event which happened here in Berlin in 1989 uh, called the end of the Cold War. And uh, it seems to me that that has been a very monumental event in mm -hmm. the life of Germany, but of Africa as well. Yeah? And it has the, the forces unleashed by that end of Cold War and by globalization as a whole have been the forces that have been driving Africa away from Europe, naturally. We don't think about Europe as sort of. Europe is, as I wrote in a column for Chatham House when I was asked a couple of months ago. I said, Europe is our past. Europe is not our future. Yeah? <laughs> That's where we're coming from. <laughs> That's not where we want to go. <laughs> because we are n neither uh, a reference nor a model nor a neighbor? Our history with Europe isn't nice. So uh, being able to be part of a globalized world, which is not Eurocentric, to us, it's liberation. Mm -hmm. It's being liberated from. So when somebody said here yeah, that uh, colonialism is still around, our escape route from colonialism is globalization. We can trade with the rest of the world. We can. T we don't have to be under the thumb of the Western hegemony, which has propped up dictators for fifty years. Uh, so as to. So it's no surprise that when the Cold War ended, the first thing which has happened in Africa is democratization. It's political transformation <laughs> that's going on. So you ask yourself, what, what, what's bothering Europe and the West? And at least, then you begin to think, uh, Europe and the West is, seems to be suffering from power hangover. 
two, two hangovers. There is colonial hangover and this global hegemony hangover. I thought the US has the global hegemony hangover. <laughs> that, that seems to me to be the thing which is driving these initiatives. They are also compounded, of course, by another victim of, of, of the global changes going on. And that victim is the international development sort of movement. And that their problem is a crisis of relevance. Yeah? Because you look at these documents, they're still taking reforms, economic reforms, creating an enabling environment. I, I, that was a language which was around when I was working for the World Bank 25, 27 years ago. So, hey, people have moved on. Yeah? They, there's no country in Africa today, no government which does not know that uh, if you want economic growth, you will not, it's private sector. It's got to be market sort of led. The state cannot, there's balance, it, stuff like that. So that, 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 that whatever has been, has been jammed. So but that, that again reflects these this, this institutions because that was, has been their construct. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are stranded, historically stranded in, in that construct. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So I said it's important to preface that because when you start asking what Africa needs, from where I see it, that's a totally sort of different paradigm. So a far more, I think, interesting question would be to ask, what is Africa doing? The other, the, the other thing you realize in this paradigm is, is actually a wrong theory, a flawed theory of development. And that theory of development has two flaws. One flaw is called industrialization. Mm -hmm. The idea that development and industrialization are synonymous. So what do you hear among the, some of my colleagues, economists and experts, is that, oh, Africa is growing very rapidly, but it's not industrializing. There's a problem. Incomes are rising, but it's not industrializing. I think that's the thing that Karl Popper called the history of the poverty of history. Because it happened this way, elsewhere, uh, that is the way it must always happen. The second part of that, and it's related, is the flow of coming directly to this, something which economists we call capital fundamentalism. The idea that development and growth and, and, and economic driven is driven by investment and capital. And that, of course, anybody who has a bit nuanced knowledge of, of, of economics and growth economics knows that's not true. Yeah? Investment co-evolves with the process of growth and development. But it doesn't cause it. In fact, most studies uh, which have tried to do this, although the methodologies are problematic, suggest that cause is the other way around. Something else is driving growth, and investment is following. Okay. Related to that, mm -hmm. which you find in these documents, again, is because it requires a lot of capital, is that there's a shortage of capital. There is no shortage of capital. Oops. Okay. In the last four years, when you've had a government which ran on a platform of mega projects, this political platform, mm -hmm. it has managed to double our foreign debt. How did it do it? Just three things. One, Chinese financing for a new railway is being launched today. Government promised a railway in 2013. Today, they're launching it, Mombasa to Nairobi. But the total finance for it is about $7 billion. They've, they've done five. When the president went to type to this Chinese thing, the Silk Road or whatever, he signed another four. Mm -hmm. Two, we went to the market with a debut uh, euro bond, the sovereign debt markets, and borrowed $3 billion. We stole one. That didn't even get home. Uh, the, the other two is just frittered away on all sorts of projects. And one or two other things, what the government took over four years ago, our total foreign debt was $9 billion. Now it's, a pro it, now it's actually exactly $18 billion. But it's not just doubled foreign debt. It's also doubled domestic debt. <coughs> because we do have a fairly sizable uh, domestic debt market. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you look at our debt ratio, it's actually 50-50. It's 50% foreign, 50% domestic. Uh, and, but also the domestic one, there's a lot of foreign participation, because if, when you have a convertible currency, mm -hmm. uh, funds sitting in London, they want exposure to, to these assets. 
And in fact, the African Development Bank actually has an Africa currency debt sort of index. Um, and uh, you could, they raise up to the uh, infrastructure bonds, so to speak. Now I think we are going on to 25 year bonds. So if countries, and obviously it doesn't apply for every country, but once countries do those things called reforms, and they are not rocket science, uh, once you do them, capital comes flooding in mm -hmm. from everywhere. A lot of that capital is not from West. So its perception of risk is very different from the perception of risk I'm reading in these documents. Mm -hmm. The perception of Brazilians and the Chinese and Indians about Africa risk is very different from German mm -hmm. because they, they operate from in similar environments. So you gotta tell a Nigerian that Kenya is risky? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah? So, this, I, so from sitting from outside and asking the question of what does Africa need is my sense is, look, good people, there's another, we need to have another conversation. Okay. You poured a lot of water into the wine of Mr. Schuknecht, and I think he has some, probably some, some replies to it. But let me also ask you one, one additional question. If you were into his shoes, would you just then throw away his little nice plan? Would you suggest him to just get rid of it? Or would you rewrite it? I think I, I, I have read those documents and uh, asked myself what's driving them. Uh, he can give said, an answer. It was said earlier that immigration is one of the things. Mm -hmm. That's another false premise because when you look at the data, I spent time looking at trying to look at the data and wondering where is this migration phobia coming from, and you realize that's a political thing, and uh, it's I don't think the European one is any different from Trump's. Uh, so that, then you find okay, if this is what I think would tell people, look, we need to face up to this thing and ask what's 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 the problem because it's not Africa, it's not a problem. So if Africa is not the problem, then this hysteria that we have to invest in Africa so that Africa, we are not overwhelmed by, by, by African migrants, maybe we could temper that hysteria and have a more rational approach uh, to, to what we want to do. The other thing, of course, which is driving it is uh, you see the world, uh, is, uh, Europe, the world seems to be reverting in terms of thinking about global, the globalized world. We seem to have reverted to 19th century mercantilism. You know, if you look at, Ch they see China, so the West is reacting to China. Uh, when I remember talking to the US, uh, friends of mine, diplomats and others, a couple of years ago, when Obama came, and what Obama should do. And uh, they agreed, also the big, what's a big thing that he could do in Africa, and it was agriculture and food security and stuff like that. By the end of his term, he was doing power, our Africa. Yeah. But what should he do? What should Mr. Shuknecht do with the plan? Come on, that. Now, I think <laughs> Europe needs to stop thinking about what Africa needs and helping Africa, and asking themselves, what do we, what is in it for us in this new world? How do we navigate this new global world? How do we trade with other parts of the world? How do we trade with Africa? How do we, how do we take advantage of these investment opportunities? Why, are, why have the Chinese, Sorry. why has African trade with the China grown 30-fold? in a decade, while for the last five years, trade, Africa trade with Europe has actually been declining in absolute terms. Okay. So once you start asking those questions, you are then, and look at the real world the way it looks like, you will not take this paternalistic yeah. trend this that we are helping that... Africa. You will say, wait a minute, the world has changed. We are no longer in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. I think we need to rethink how we do things with other people. Okay. Mr. Schuknecht, this is a lot of food for thought. Paternalistic, old-fashioned, not useful to, our, to the needs of Africa. So what do you do with the paper? I, I think that um, one, it, it's good to hear the African perspective, at least one African perspective, and uh, also be reminded to be humble about the things that one does. I, I think that is, is very important. I mean, our initiative is not going to save the world, and it's not going to be that we in five years will say, thanks to the German initiative, Africa is now a rich continent. Um, but but I, I, I would say oh, we, have, we have put 
this initiative to the test. The first test is that it's demand-driven. I mentioned the five first countries that are interested in it, and these are not just countries, I think they don't have a record of just looking at the dollar signs in our eyes and try to grab the money and run. These are countries that actually um, have governments that want to develop, help develop, contribute to developing the country, and these countries have functioning institutions and functioning private sectors. So uh, this is the, the fact that African countries want this initiative, I think, is not a bad sign. Um, the second, the second uh, point that I want to make is um, as perhaps not making me popular with anyone here, but um, I don't believe in an initiative that dishes out arms, you know, that is charitable. It's, this is about improving the environment for investment. And what are investments about? Investments are about profits. And they're about profits for investors. And the result of these profits are, as uh, David has said, you know, it's a, it's, it's a mutually, in a, in, a good, in a good world, it's a mutually reinforcing pro process where growth and investment reinforce each other, and many other things have to come together with that. I think there we might disagree or might not disagree, but it's education, functioning institutions, etc. So it's profits. And um, I agree with David that um, perhaps there's a lot to learn for Europeans and German investors in the sense that what they see as risky, others might not find particularly risky. But what I do believe is that if a small uh, uh, enterprise in an African country has to pay 20% interest rates because the uh, financial markets are not developed, because there's political uncertainty, then this holds back investment. It requires profit margins that are so high that a lot of profitable investments don't happen. You know, and that would happen if the profit margins uh, and if interest rates were lower, if real interest rates were lower. So I think there is there is something that can be done about improving the environment for investment and thereby setting in motion this process that I think we would all agree on exists. And um, there, it is true that there is a risk that um, uh, the process and the initiative is captured by uh, neo, I, I don't want to call them neo colonialist, but um, old fashioned thinking. Old fashioned thinking in our countries where it's about, you know, elementing an, an aid industry, element, uh, you know, doing things to ingratiate them yourself with NGOs. I mean, all this is happening. But, um, and I'm, I'm sure we cannot avoid this 100%. But we have tried to set up the process in a manner that the Europeans are not in the driver's seat. The ultimate driver is the African country that wants to take part in the initiative. And they need to tell and work with the IOs and us uh, if, if they want to work with us. And they need to say, they say what they want to do and then work with us to their benefit. And um, that, that, I think, is a second or third element that, um, that should, should be different from the past. I mean, it's true. I can tell you that already now, you know, there are discussions in the G20 whether Germany can really play a prominent role, because after all, it did the Berlin Conference in 18-whatever. I mean, who cares, frankly? And then, uh, but what is really behind it is whether, you know, France and the UK can accept that Germany actually does an initiative and not France and the UK. Of course this plays a role. So what have we done? G20 is the best place to do this because you have Indians in there, you have Chinese in there who as investors are interested to have more opportunities. And you have South Africa in there who thinks it's a great idea. And by the way, South Africa, I think, Many people in South Africa also think it's, it's good to get this inspiration because their domestic policies are not always that ideal. So um, I, I think with these observations, I, I think that at least we are trying to set up a structure 
that avoid some of the uh, problems that David rightly uh, identified. What about the argument that our perspective is still, uh, or our perception is still a wrong one when we assume that there is a lack of capital because David was actually saying there is no lack of capital. Actually, I learned yesterday when we had uh, Carlos Lopez here that it's an African country that's the biggest investor in India, not vice versa. So it's Mauritius investing in Africa. So our perspective or perception is still Africa needs capital, whereas David makes the argument there's capital. Yeah, but this is not what I'm saying. I mean, the initiative is about the framework conditions for investment. Mm -hmm. It's not putting up yet again more money. There is enough money. There is enough money in international organizations. There is enough money in our development budgets. There is enough money floating around in the world as a whole. But there is a lack of trust. Mm -hmm. There is a lack of trust to do something useful with this money at an interest rate that then is also profitable for the investors. And the lack of trust is, is reflected in these very high local interest rates and in the unwillingness of people to go. And I think, it's as David has said it himself, I mean, you do the right reforms and the money comes. But it's not... It's, um, Kenya, I think, is, a, is, is actually one of the better countries, but there are still quite a few countries where you know, the role of the private sector and the importance of what good institutions is not taken for granted, is not, not, uh, not happening. And, and frankly, I mean, you know, when I look around here in our country and in some of the Western countries, we have a lot to learn as well. So um, uh, I, I think it is, uh, he, he's right. It's, it's not a matter of putting up more money. And, when you see the responses in countries and in ministries, the instinct is immediately to say, well, I need bigger budgets because I want to put more money into Africa. Well, that's maybe why it's a good idea to have the initiative with the finance ministry because the finance ministry tries not to waste the money but to keep it together and to use it efficiently. <laughs> David, you want to reply right away? <laughs> you know... Uh, about three weeks ago, Senegal was the 16th country to debut in the sovereign bond market. They wanted to raise $1 billion for infrastructure investments. Senegal. Senegal, yes. The offer was oversubscribed eight times. So they wanted $1 billion. They were offered $8 billion. <laughs> Everybody thought that after the collapse of oil prices and the US interest rates start going up, uh, this money would dry up. There would be no money out there hunting for yields in uh, frontier markets. Uh, I checked la before I came here, and uh, Kenya's bonds, Nigeria's bonds, Ghana, uh, all these countries are actually trading at below issue price, between 100 and 200 basis points. So the Kenyan bonds are now trading at something like 4%. That means if we get a few more things right, we'll be able to borrow money the same rates as Italy and then Spain, <laughs> which we will do. So the point is, so that's the markets. If you can go to the markets, and the question is, so what we're talking about people frozen in time. If you can't go to the markets, then what imposes on you the uh, discipline is, is these sort of processes that you need sort of this international. What do you had? You had there's a very big paradigm shift from being on an IMF program, which is what we used to use as the stamp of approval, even to get commercial bank credit lines for trade and stuff like that. Uh, and when you go to the market, when you are now subject to market discipline, because if you mismanage yourself, your yields go up, and you're going to borrow money very cheaply at all. In fact, you start running refinancing risk. So once you go into the market, the preoccupation of the government is how do I keep my yields low? It's a very different. So you no longer need uh, international organizations coming to tell you to do this and do the other, because the market will tell you more efficiently uh, than, uh, than international organizations will. And if you negotiate a, a credit from the IMF and all these people, it's going to take you one year of jumping hoops. Uh, you go to the market, you get the money in a day. Now, so you've got that. You've also got, as you said, Chinese capital. They have their own brand of capitalism, which is very different from everybody else's. They don't see the same risks. You've got, like, in some countries. So what do we, as, what do, we do? If you have all this portfolio of choices of what you should do, the issue becomes not raising capital, 
but whether you yourselves have the right plans of what to do with capital. And, exactly that, and that is not, you're not going to be told from outside. But this is exactly, I think, the, the, the key point that we should actually discuss bet amongst, uh, between you. Where should the capital go to? Some of the criticism of, of these plans and of some of the development plans of African governments itself is that they sound very much 60th. L big dams, big streets, uh, the big things where you can push lots of money into it. Is there something to this argument that this is also part of the old fashionism of, of, of these kind of plans? Would you? Um, infrastructure is, is, is a very important um, element of a country's growth and development path. I mean, without energy, without roads, without sewage systems, so on, it's, it's very difficult to run a modern economy or to move towards a modern economy. And many of these investments are bulky. So I don't think it really has anything to do with the thinking of the 60s. It's, it's the nature of many, of many projects that they are relatively bulky. If you want to create a motorway also here from one city to another, it's, it's, it's just uh, it's a bulky thing. So, um, uh, there, and you cannot handle that the same manner as a private investment. It has to be planned properly, and if all that is done properly, and private financing can enter into that, and uh, if it's then managed properly, uh, some, some of these bulky investments can also finance itself through user charges, so you can get pretty much close to a private environment. That's far away from the 60s, where everything was like big government things, and uh, you know, private sector didn't really play a role. Then you have a second type of uh, investment, and that is that what the private sector then really does, and where it's the government is not involved at all in the planning, you know, whether some small or medium sized enterprise or even some big company like a foreign big company, what they do in a country doesn't depend on the government saying, I want you to produce spoons or uh, provide uh, IT services or else, uh, whatever. The government can, can improve the framework conditions, can, set the, uh, can ensure property rights, ensure that there are functioning courts, etc. But the government will not say, you have to produce next week uh, you know, 1,000 chairs or, or 10,000 shirts. And uh, it's, it's this kind of market-driven investment that I think is, is, is absolutely key, and um, uh, uh, that, that is also the difference to the 60s. I think in the 60s there was little understanding of this. So, so I, I think we've moved uh, a long way uh, from, from then. David, what's, what's your assessment? You said that we also have the wrong perception that Africa has to go through this dirty phase of industrialization, so do all the dirty things, and then finally it will be prosperous and good. I think it's, uh, uh, we, have a, we have a government in Kenya which was elected four years ago, mm -hmm. four and a half years ago, on a platform of mega infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And they've done, that's what they've done, a lot. We are running on a platform of back to basics. You're not going to do mega infrastructure. Our, our, our flagship program is raising the agricultural productivity of the poor and universal access to health. Maybe I'm letting the cat out of the bag a little bit. So what point am I making? As countries democratize, you have different governments being elected on different platforms. Mm -hmm. We're just becoming like everybody else. So this idea that there is a long-term agenda with a government coming and uh, it, it discusses, again, it's the people who are frozen in the past, where you negotiated with a dictator who was uh, sort of president for life, and that becomes the country's program forever. It, they are, it's completely unpredictable. Uh, Tanzania. I was, had, had, was on the verge of signing the EPA. They had an election within the same party, different platform. The new president has said, forget it. I'm not going to sign that thing. So what you're saying is that you have different parties, like it's normal in, in and, democratic exactly. countries with different ideas of development. Exactly. And your idea is not going that quick way. Ideas of development are contested, mm -hmm. even within Africa. Policy is contested everywhere in a mm -hmm. democracy. So you've got a bunch of people saying they'll do this. You've got a bunch of people saying they're doing something else. And a bunch of people sitting in Berlin uh, thinking that they are planning for those bunch of people. We also have differences in Berlin about which yeah, way to go. Precisely. Even that, I can hear that already. You've got a bunch <laughs> of people sitting in one place with a different perspective from a bunch of people sitting elsewhere. And that's my point. Uh, 
about people who were really frozen in, in time. If you look at the Nigerian government uh, now, has a very different platform from the Nigerian government. So uh, like most parts, I remember when I was in the UK uh, as a student, first there was uh, uh, conservative government privatizing everything. Then there was a Labour government which was even renationalizing some of those things. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's the world. And we are part of that world. Mr. Luca, there, there is this, do you assume with your plan that there's something like a neutral idea of development that everybody agrees to, which David actually calls into question? I, I think this frozen in time is a distraction. And uh, um, it's, it's I mean, you need both. You need infrastructure and you need the different type of development and investment that David is referring to and that what I was referring to as the kind of small and medium-sized enterprise type development. I mean, his is more concrete. You know, you need agriculture to, to move on, to become more productive, to move into processing and so on. I think you, your way of putting it is much smarter than me. That shows that I'm a bureaucrat and, and you're, a, you're a politician. But I think we... Frankly, I think we mean the same thing, or at least I hope we mean the same thing. Um, the, 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 there, is, there is, of course, an issue with continuity. Um, I mean, if you build a road and you stop after 80% is completed, you will not have any benefits and you have spent the money. So I, I think there is something to say for continuity. But of course, also different governments and different parties have to have different <laughs> focuses and different platforms. In Germany, the, the, the big wave of infrastructure investment was in the 70s and maybe until the 80s. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, then it was done, at least the road infrastructure. Then different infrastructure, the greening environmental infrastructure started to be built. And um, uh, so, so, I mean, my, my, uh, I, I don't know the situation in African countries well enough. I only know that it's very different in different countries. I think Kenya is much more advanced than, let's say, the Sahel countries and so on. Um, so, so I think that um, uh, the initiative we are having here um, is, is it's not going to be free of the problem you are mentioning, that governments may set the wrong priorities. You know, a government in this initiative may say, well, we need to have now a lot of focus on energy infrastructure because we don't have secure electricity supplies and this will make the processing of the food that is produced or the transport of the food that is produced to markets impossible. So we need to reduce this waste and create more efficiency and for this we need infrastructure. Well, we hope that is, this is correct. But we, as Germany, as G20 presidency, we cannot control this. We hope that these country teams, where all these people work together, that they get it roughly right, and that they actually contribute to the political process in the sense that they can help convince also in the political process to set the right priorities and to uh, to to have less um, less of uh, special interest driven. Um, uh, agendas which then need to be reversed a couple of years later because they have proven to be uh, faulty. You see, we could probably go on another hour up here with the debate, but I think at this point I would also like to bring you in. You can ask a question. There will be a microphone coming from the back, either in German or in English. I would like to ask you to be brief. If you, if you just start there in the back, because the microphone is actually over there. And if you could present yourself briefly. Yeah, thank please. you, Claudia Simons. I've already been on the panel, so I think everybody knows me now. Um, thank you very much for, for giving us uh, your, your insights on that. One question that I always had um, for you, Mr. Mr. Uh, Schuknecht, and I wasn't able to ask you last time we met, is you talk a lot about uh, reform champions, uh, transformation of uh, you know, uh, institutional uh, frameworks and so on and so forth, and now we hear that two of the countries that are actually now compact countries, Rwanda and Ethiopia, uh, I, I find it very interesting to hear that actually, because both of those countries I think are reform champions in a way, in terms of institutions, very strong institutions, business climate and so on and so forth, so whoever wants to do business in Africa, go to Rwanda, it's really good, but then it's very problematic in terms of human rights. So I'm asking myself, the, the idea of reform champions, is it only directed towards business climate? Or is there a component of you know, good governance in terms of human rights, in terms of social and ecological uh, uh, transformation and sustainability? 
Okay, could you hand over the microphone to the lady next to you? There was no, there's none. I think we collect two or three questions, and we um, maybe the yeah, and then we come to the front. Um, I also have. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, two questions for Mr. Schuknecht concerning the compacts with Africa. Um, I guess the idea behind this, I mean, most of the compact states are so-called lion states, so economically strong countries. And the idea behind this, I assume, is to um, to leverage investment so that they also can act as a stabilizing, um, stabilizing countries for the for the neighboring countries. Um, so would it? Wouldn't it also make sense to um, include least development countries, least developed countries or fragile states into the compacts, um, because they also can be a source of destabilization? And, in, and if there's investment, this could maybe be part of of um, helping stop this process. And the other thing is, aren't you? Oh, let me say it this way: Last weekend we saw the G7 summit, which was in many ways. I would say disaster. <laughs> um, aren't you afraid that, in terms of um, every African-related topic, which doesn't seem to be a big priority for the U.S. administration, um, the same thing can happen again? So that there's no real um, outcome which is valuable as an outcome. Okay, I think we take one more question up here in the first row. Could you bring the microphone or hand it over? I think it's coming. Thank, thank you very much. I hope you can indulge me. My question comes in four parts. In four parts, OK. Yes. Um, <laughs> so my name is Mtunzi from South Africa. Um, I'm in the B20. I'm one of the co-chairs for the Business 20 Germany employment and, uh, and education, amongst other things. I think, uh, Mr. Schuchnacht, uh, it's, 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 I align myself with a lot of the things that, by the way, David has said, just so that you know which side of the fence I'm coming from. Um, it doesn't come as a surprise. Um, so we've noted your cross-referencing with the 2063 um, you know, agenda. Um, but what I would like to ask you is, would you say that it represents the German perception of Africa's aspirations? Um, it's a, that's a very important question because you've done it, but we're not aware that there were any consultations. You sat in a room with Africans. So when you say it's a compact with Africa, compact for Africa, to most people it would sound, from a perception point of view, like just rhetoric, because you know it was done for, even though now you're engaging with, you know, so to speak. And how or what process, would be my second question, have you followed to sell it to the other 20 countries in the G20. In South Africa, by the way, I mean, as far as I'm aware, we're still watching. Uh, we, we haven't really excitedly, excitedly bought into this. I've just asked one of my government officials just to be safe now. He's just SMS me to say, well, quite frankly, we think it's for Africa. Um, so, so for me, the reason I ask is because the G20 changes hands every year. We're going to Argentina now. Um, and how do you make sure that it's a G20 process rather than a German process from a, a buy-in point of view? The, the third thing is we hear, and, and I'd like to hear from you that the cons you have a consultant who's German who, who works on this. Uh, if that's true, aesthetically and sensitively, you know, how do you think that works with perceptions as opposed to having an African consultant so that it really is engagement with Africans rather than you know, Germans uh, assuming to understand what the issues are on the ground. Lastly, um, is this just a happy coincidence with the elections, or is it likely to, beyond, to go beyond the German elections? OK, pretty tricky questions. I think you. Yeah, these are a lot of questions. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, feel, I feel only moderately encouraged by the questions, I must admit. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> if, it, if it wasn't for the support from the African countries we had, I, I, would, be, I, would, be, um, I would be wondering whether you aren't right. But, um, but let me start with a human rights point. Um, yeah, this is an important point. Um, should you have selection criteria for the countries that you pick? And it links also with the question on the fragile versus more developed states. But, I mean, G20 is a very heterogeneous group. 
which, as you know, doesn't only have kind of Western-type democracy uh, as members. And uh, if you had started a debate on uh, which countries can participate, you could extend that, by the way, to the G membership of G20 itself. Um, and the mandate of the group is very narrow. The mandate is private investment. It was deliberately chosen also to help the uh, de ideologize de uh, to make it less ideological. Yeah, that's easier <laughs> to pronounce. Um, because, you know, I mean, human rights, I think, is a very good motive to reflect whether this is something that should qualify a country or not. But there are much less uh, honest and good motives, um, you know, history, backward thinking. Um, and uh, even within our government, I think the set of countries we would have could have agreed on on the basis of we first would not even have been able to agree on the criteria within the German government, not to even speak about the G20. And then the, con the number of countries that we as Europeans, I thought, by the way, we wanted this to be an initiative with Africa, not for. So we as Europeans would have found suitable uh, kind of communally would have probably been relatively close to zero. Um, so um, I think business money, in a way, business is, is, is much more neutral. I mean, Germany, in Germany also politics in the past was much more neutral. We traded with East Germany. We are, you know, when they were still communist. And uh, the idea was change through trade. Now here you could also argue change through investment. I, I personally am a strong believer in this. You know, uh, when countries develop and become wealthier, I mean, they, they, it's much harder to keep up a dictatorship under those circumstances. So um, the CWA country stabilizing the neighbors, yes, we hope that is a good effect. And uh, it's, uh, if, if, if those of you who know the Jordan Compact know that it's that the uh, uh, dealing with the uh, fallout from the neighborhood, the refugees, is, is, very, uh, is a very important element of that. Um, of course, over time, if the initiative is successful and finds an interest, if the approach is successful, the, the, there is likely to be more of an interest also from more fragile states. So far, we haven't had that interest um, because the preconditions to really get private investment going are often not met. But I think the, once there's more experience, uh, once we see, you know, does the model work or under which circumstances does it work, it, it, it can, we can very well uh, imagine, you know, if there are countries like Niger or Mali or others coming, that they could very well, if they say, we want to do this, nobody, I mean, Germany would, or at least the German finance ministry as G20 presidency would be the last one to say no. Um, now, on the US commitment, this is, this is an important point. The US is, this is clearly not the first strategic priority of the US, but the US cu counterparts in the American Treasury are very supportive of this initiative even though they are not going to be the lead protagonist. And I think that is also appropriate if you want to strengthen ownership. If you want to encourage ownership, it's better if, if, if the US takes kind of a, a supportive but um, less activist role. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I have the feeling that um, you know, there is that people like to wallow in the fact, you know, that we are, um, we are, uh, you know, that whatever we do is is kind of not good. Either it doesn't follow certain standards, or it has the wrong motives, or whatnot. But I think this is an initiative that tries to learn from many of the mistakes of the past. And one of the mistakes of the past probably was also not to um, get enough ownership from the people that one actually wants to deal with. That is here, the African countries. So the uh, question on consultation, I, I must say that I think we painstakingly, uh, the process painstakingly involved uh, the um, African compact countries. They, um, uh, when they contacted uh, us or the IOs, 
they went into a dialogue with the IOs on whether this initiative was actually something suitable for them. We, we as German presidency cannot do this. Um, we have great excitement in South Africa, by the way. South Africa, the Ministry of Finance people, they're going to come here next uh, in two weeks' time for the conference. I don't know maybe uh, whether your counterpart is not in the finance ministry, but the finance minister is going to come, his deputy, his double deputy. They are likely to take a very prominent role in the G20 in this regard. Um, and, you know, they, I don't want to go into the details of how the G20 is organized, but they're going to take a very prominent role, and they have already uh, asked us to support them on getting this also continued, we, and we're working with the Argentinians to have continuation. So the, the point is very important, continuity in G20, and Argentina, it's like the U.S. a bit, you know, this is not the neighboring uh, region, so their interest is, is more limited, but the advantage of G20 is that people who are participating truly get a global perspective. And um, uh, that, that is, for, for Argentina, this is, this is less interesting, but they see that this is an important initiative. And we have a lot of support from China as well, because China has also made, you know, they've also gone through a cycle. Uh, somebody mentioned this, you mentioned this example of the, of the railway being put in the middle of uh, the country uh, without regards of the local needs and just, you know, finance through loans and so on. In China, there's also a, a change going on, and they, they, are, they don't know how to... How to their, their model has only had limited success. So we, we see that China is very, um, very interested in the initiative, and we hope that actually they also become partner of uh, some of the compact countries. So... Um, I, I, I think we have tried to deal with some of your rightful concerns that, um, that this is truly not an initiative, yet another initiative we are imposing on others. Um, but only time will tell how successful we are. All right. Um, where's the microphone? Is it... I think the... So in the first row, and then I'll move over there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Roger. Um, I'm going to use that your opposition to ask how you think you will get out of the pass. Could, I mean, could you tell us wh where you come from so that we get to Oh, I thought everyone knew that I come from Cameroon because I was sitting a, on a panel <laughs> before we started. Sorry for this. Some people just came <laughs> in, sorry. I, I, I'm Martin Sunke from Africa Development Change Network. It's an organization based in Cameroon, radiating on the continent. So I was saying that I'm going to use the opposition that we just heard here to ask how you're going to step from the past, because David said Europe was... African's history. Is that what you said? So I'm, I'm trying to find out how you think you are going to jump from that past and land in the future of Africa with this your plan. If you don't make it a real conversation with those whom you are targeting with the plan, because I don't see this in the plan now. Whenever we say you did it for Africa, you respond, no, we are doing it with Africa. But indeed, there might be some aspect of having done it for Africa. How do you adjust on this? I mean, let us take what we have and see how we make it, I'm using your words, how we make it useful, because you talked about being useful. And you also talked about avoiding the mistakes that we made 50 years ago in the initiative that we had. So how do, how do, how do you jump? and get into the future of Africa with this plan, how flexible can you make it for you to be able to use it and jump in the future of Africa? Thank okay. you. Could you hand over the microphone? Mr. Shuki, maybe you should just invite some of the people here from the audience for lunch and you get more input after. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, I have microphone. a request for you, um, Mr. Shuknek. Um, uh, the, in order to advance the compact with Africa, the German government has asked the World Bank to come up 
with a model contract for public-private partnerships. And the World Bank will be delivering its model contract to you uh, before the summit. We've had a couple of legal teams in Washington, D.C. compare the contract with international investment agreements. And they've found that there's far more burden on the state. It restricts the right to regulate in the state to protect human rights and the public interest. And it allows suits of governments for strikes or protests or things that delay projects. We'll be having a letter uh, coming to you next week asking you, really pleading with you to either reject the work of the World Bank or postpone it until it's opened up to a much wider consultation. There has been a consultation, but a much wider consultation. And in closing, when you were in the panel in Washington uh, on the Business 20 with the uh, minister from Rwanda, you know, he was saying, yes, we're with the compact with Africa. We're for investment. And just to prove it, we allow investors to establish a business in Rwanda in six hours. Not six days, but six hours. And this does not permit due diligence. So there has to be a balance between investor and state citizen interests. Thank you. We have another five minutes left, and we want Mr. Schuchlich to, to give us an answer. Have, could you be very, very brief with your questions? OK, so I take those two. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, <laughs> Reinhard Palm from Bread for the World, Brot for die Welt. I have, again, sorry, David, a question for, for Mr. Schuchnecht. Um, I, I would be interested um, to learn a little bit. You said it's, it's contributing to the agenda 2030 and 2063. So can you a little bit say how much is it really contributing to sustainable development? Is, it, is, it, is there any content? Is there, are there selection criteria? And how do you make sure that at least the bilateral contributions or the multilateral contributions are contributing to poverty alleviation, to structural transformation? And how do you as, adhere with your own contribution to, to, to basic human rights and social standards? Okay. Um, this would be the one question. And one is only- Give the others also the opportunity to, to ask a question, okay. please. There's a lady in the back. Sorry to be rude, but time is the one limit that I can't really <laughs> negotiate. Thanks a lot for the, for the introductions you made. I, I, I felt like it's a lot about, Mr. Schuchnecht, you said, uh, driven by demand. It's, about, it's a lot about who is dealing with whom. Uh, and then I found a very interesting question, is Europe obsolete? Because, David, you said, basically, we don't need you. So who is dealing with whom? If, if you look at uh, the question that was raised earlier, Mr. Schuchnecht, you said earlier, from the German side, the Marshall Plan is the bigger framework, and what we do with the compact is focusing on investment. But then on the governance question, we put it down on human rights, and yes, we can't agree in the G20, but isn't, isn't Europe not obsolete because we bring in certain values on governance, and should we not discuss this in the G20? And then to David, aren't your leaders a problem in itself with the question of, is Europe obsolete? Because when the Europeans invited to Lavaletta, your leaders, African leaders, came and they said, put more money, and we agree to your plan. Okay. Just as an example. Thanks for the question. Now a couple of people are looking angry at me, but we have four minutes left, two for you and two for you. Good. No, thanks. Uh, I, I think the, the test will be whether, you know, the initiative will lead to investment. Investment in infrastructure, investment in the economy, uh, private investment. That's the test. What are we doing? I mean, I think the main contribution is we're helping to bring together the uh, government people from the compact countries with private investors. In practical terms, this is the most important contribution. And uh, uh, also the fact that we are trying to encourage and to contribute to the approaches being comprehensive, not fragmented. When I talk to African uh, um, um, leaders, they say the fragmentation is a big problem. 
Um, so I, I think these two these two are uh, ways, you know. And then whether European investors or others take advantage of this, well, you know, if if we don't have any courageous people in in our continent, other continents, other investors from other countries and other continents will take advantage of the opportunities when they arise. And I think that's good. And in that sense, if in that sense Europe is obsolete, fine. I think. So be it. Uh, I, I think that for German investors, this is a real opportunity. They have been very successful in Asia, so why should they not look to Africa and also uh, seize, seize the moment? But if they don't, well, that's, that's uh, up to them. Um, the, uh, the issue of the model contract and the balance between business and citizens, um, I, 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 it's too complex to go into too much detail. I agree we need to have a balance, but uh, at the same time, a bureaucracy is an obstacle, and you can also deal with uh, problems uh, of business by monitoring them and making sure that they obey the law. Um, and um, the contribution to sustainable development, well, if investment leads to jobs, and jobs help to generate the tax revenue that finance education, and if investment and profits help to generate the tax revenue that finance roads and education and whatnot, then I think this is the foundation of sustainable development. Because without a functioning economy, you will not have sustainable development. So um, in that sense, I would say, um, do we need Europe for all this? No. I think it's a coincidence that Germany, as, its pres as presidency of the G20, uh, started this initiative. Uh, it could have been Turkey, it could have been the US, it could have been anybody. David, what's your take? I'll, make, I'll, make, I'll respond to things, two final points. What's, what's, uh, what does Africa need and what's, uh, what was going if you to use that language? When I'm watching Africa, because I'm in only one part, so I spend a lot of time watching the rest of it, it's huge. The thing which uh, we follow most is what we call, uh, let me back up, somebody wrote a book on Africa called breakout nations. I, don't remember, I haven't read the book, but I like that, that, that phrase. Because what I watch is which nations are breaking out. And what I bring breakout, I mean breakout politically. So we now look at uh, which countries are actually turning the political corner. Because political transformation is the most fundamental thing driving things in Africa. I've spent 25 years, uh, I left economics 25 years ago, because I realized that where the change needs to happen is in politics. To build political institutions. It's much harder work than development. But if you get it right, saying, OK, I said, building uh, the most fundamental development that needs to happen in Africa is political. And that only us can do. Mm -hmm. So when I'm watching and the colleagues which I exchange views with are not in development, it's like, what's going on where? So now we see Ghana has moved another step. And then all of a sudden, Gambia jumps a step. Yeah? So if you ask me which countries are leading in Africa, Cape Verde is a sort of a leading sort of both social economic and, and political development. You see Ghana's following suit. And who is the farthest behind is Rwanda and Ethiopia. Yeah? So that's my continuum of African development. And as in Kenya, we are struggling because we've democratized. But we still have the old political order. We keep alternating. Mm -hmm. So the old political order, so our hope this election is that we sort of do a full transition and join the Ghanas. Uh, Tanzania seems to be doing it within their old party. So th those are the things we watch. Because you know, once we get more countries a critical mass of Africans democratizing, uh, being able to, that's how we're able to speak on our terms. Because you look at the people who are going out to look for these things, they are the people who need external legitimation because they don't have domestic legitimacy. So that's why they go out looking. Uh, you're not going to find the president of Cape Verde following these sort of uh, initiatives. Um, second, um, on Europe and whether Europe, Europe is not obsolete. What mm -hmm. is happening is that if you look at our relationship, Africa's historical with re relationship with Europe was disproportionate. We were trading 60% with Europe. We shouldn't have been trading 60% with Europe, other than colonial ties. Intra-Africa trade was like zero percent, uh, two, three percent. In the EAC now, uh, in fact, within the Comesa, 
like uh, AAC, our regional trade as a passenger share of trade has overtaken our share with Europe. And we want to go more in that direction. Now, if you look at what the EPAs, for instance, have been trying to do. Should have talked about them as well. but we The EPAs know. have been trying to divide and rule countries within uh, a regional trading, mm -hmm. a, reg a REC, a regional economic uh, community, like the EAC, which is fundamentally more important. So European trade is very important for Kenya, but it's not as important for the other countries. So what do we do? We are going to be the losers if we don't sign the EPA. So we as Kenya have to ask, but we're going to give up that. Regional integration is more important mm -hmm. to us than the EAC. So my, our proposal, uh, if whatever, is we are not gonna, we're going to get out of uh, law by convention. That's going to be my policy position if we win the election. And we are pursuing a free trade agreement with the Gulf Cooperation Council so that we can export our horticulture product, which we are exporting to Europe, to the Gulf market. So that's the way we're thinking. We are asking, how do we play uh, in a globalized world? Mm -hmm. So I think Europe needs to understand that we are no longer in the world of partnerships. We are in the world of transaction. Okay. Who do you transact with? So that's what I'm saying. Partnership is legacy. OK, this is the final word of this debate. <laughs> I thank both of you. <laughs> for being so frank, for being so engaged in, in this debate. I enjoyed it a lot. I learned a lot. Thank you for being provocative. I think there's a lot of things to keep talking about. As you said, there is not a scarcity of, of capital, but a scarcity of, of time, of time to talk to each other. We could have spent another hour talking about the EPAs, the European Partnership Agreements. Maybe we do this at a later time at a different conference. Thank you for listening. I think you will be staying around for, for a moment. Yes. So if you have any further questions, just talk um, bilaterally. There's lunch down there. So enjoy your lunch, and thanks for listening. Thank you.